Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, a new series for, with this lesson, is on the Book of Acts. And this lesson, the first lesson, is entitled, You Will Be My Witnesses. It's the lesson for July 7 of 2018. And, of course, you could guess that this focuses primarily on the first chapter of Acts. What happened in those first few days and weeks after the crucifixion and the resurrection? So that's what we'll be talking about. Let's begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, it's a privilege always to recognize your presence with us, to seek to understand better what you have took, given us in your word, what you want us to understand, to think about these experiences of the early church and how they might be replicated at the end of time, which we hope will be very soon. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, people have talked about the impact of the life of Jesus. Some people have even said that it has split history in two. There was B.C. and A.D., as some would call it, and of course others trying to be more politically correct call it B.C.E. and C.E., but we still call it B.C. and A.D. But there's another, there are other major really junctions in the history of, of, of mankind, and one of them comes after Jesus ascends to heaven. Um, prior to that, the gospel seemed to have been primarily focused on the Jewish nation. But now we find clearly hints that God wants them to go to everyone in all the world. And we'll see how that works out as we, we, uh, we move along. So in order for that to happen, the physical Jesus had to ascend to his Father and send in his place the Holy Spirit, who wasn't limited by any geographical location. Um, why was that necessary? Couldn't Jesus have just stayed here and the Holy Spirit could have gone on with his work? Don't everybody talk well, about this? Well, he, he had to ascend uh, to anoint the sanctuary because the kingdom of grace had not, uh, been, wasn't instituted until he died. So he had to ascend to, uh, in, if you look closely in Hebrews 9, mm -hmm. where it talks about uh, cleansing the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The context is, is the cleansing that Moses did to inaugurate the sanctuary, not the work that Aaron did to, uh, on an annual basis. So in order to, when he, he died, he rose, in a sense he, he cleansed the sanctuary or, or dedicated it for the service of, of salvation. If he hadn't died, he could have gone back and left us to die. Yeah. So there's a distinct mm -hmm. uh, dividing line there. So the kingdom of grace, while it was promised, and I can bring up the quotation yeah. of this great controversy, it started with his death okay. and was anointed. So I think he had to go so that the spirit could come. Okay. Well, there's a scholarly and slightly more sophisticated. I have a very simple answer, yes. I, I have a fairly simple answer to it, maybe the same one you've had, because I yeah. think I've heard it from you probably, and that is that the disciples, the people that Jesus spent three and a half years with, ministering to, teaching, if Jesus stayed there, they would have kept as his subordinates. Mm -hmm. They would not have branched out. They would not have gone to to Samaria, to Judea, you know, to why, the Why should they leave the Jesus? Yeah. I mean, this is where the action is. Yeah. It's comfortable. They, they needed to have that paradigm shift, that fruit basket upset, to change the whole outlook. Yeah. So, uh, so Nary, you've got, for our audience, you've got two uh, different approach, approaches to this, and I think both are probably true. Um, Jesus needed to do some impressive things to change their way of thinking. We call it their paradigm. And he did that, first of all, by going through that what happened over crucifixion weekend, and then secondly, by 
leaving them 50 days later. Well, um, well there's more ways than one that he left yeah. them. I think we should emphasize the fact that he left them when he went to his grave. Yeah. That is really the only time when he left humanity and the rest of the universe. That's right. And going to his grave was supposed to be for us the greatest lesson we could possibly ever learn, mm -hmm. which is that love goes all the way to one's death mm -hmm. and does not stop short of one's death. Yeah. Well, I, I keep trying to struggle with imagining myself among the disciples and what happened from that Thursday night supper in the upper room to the Sunday night meeting when Jesus comes back and then over the next 50 days up to Pentecost. What kind of changes happened in those people's thinking? I mean, their mind must have been just going <laughs> like this. I mean, and what do we know about what happened during that time? Not much. Well, he appeared, well, you're, you're going through that, I think. But they, yeah, so he appeared uh, in several situations. Can you uh, name one? Or? Well, uh, th uh, the one at the end of John up in Galilee. Yeah. He had to, if you look back in Matthew, he's, there's about three texts where it says he's going forward to yeah. Galilee. I'm going forward to Galilee. So they went yeah. <laughs> to Galilee. So there's that and uh, the appearance in the upper room a couple times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the, the most immediate one, of course, would be that time, the first on Sunday evening, when he appeared to the disciples, and probably other people in the room as well. And, and before had, that, the road to Emmaus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. I was thinking, because they came back, and I was thinking those same, so it was that one from Emmaus to back to the upper room. Yeah, that would be the first one. And what happened one week later? Well, Thomas hadn't been there yeah, the first exactly. time, so he was, and he was a little. That's where we get the doubting Thomas from. Mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah. so uh, he was there the next Sunday, and uh, Jesus appeared and sort yeah. of chided him about. And it. a lot of pastors have talked about that. Imagine if every believing Christian or every one who wanted to believe in Jesus had said, okay, I'm not going to believe until I touch him, until I put my finger in his hands and I, you know, put my hand on his side, where would the church be? There wouldn't be one. On the other hand, it must be said that Thomas wanted proof. Yeah. And I think with more often we should want proof as well for what we believe. <laughs> what? So let's talk for a, just a moment about the Jewish paradigm that they had, that the disciples had grown up with. Where did that come from? It came from the Old Testament, from the scriptures, from a part of the scriptures. Yes. What we find in the Old Testament scriptures, and we have some verses here. On one side, we have the promises of a Messiah who's going to come, he's going to reign, he's going to reign forever, he's going to rule over the whole world, etc. Places like Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4 and 35 to 37. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Ezekiel 37, 25. Daniel 2, 44. Daniel 7, 13 to 42. 44, I'm sorry. If you look at those passages and you say, wow, the Messiah is coming. He's going to get us out of this Roman mess. And boy, isn't that wonderful. But there were other passages that they obviously didn't enjoy reading and studying so much such as Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12, and verses even like Daniel 9, 26, make it clear that the Messiah is not just going to come to be a king, the rule over the world forever. He's going to come to suffer and maybe even to die. Um, so let me just ask you, if you had to choice between those, you, and you didn't see how they could both be true, and you had to choose between one and the other, which would you choose? The one that appealed to my pride, my lust, my whatever. <laughs> Your well-being. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we, we shouldn't complain too much about them. Yes. So the solution to that is what? That the first list of texts that you read is about the third coming? 
Well, or is it, it about the second coming and the third coming, a combination about the future, if the time when Jesus will come to rule. Yeah. yeah which is the third coming. Yeah. If you're talking about on this earth, it's yeah. the third coming. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and those, those promises are true. They're just not here yet. Or were they conditional promises? Well, I suppose you can make an argument for that too in some cases. Yeah. Well, we know that um, the disciples just didn't get it. Jesus tried repeatedly, three or maybe four times that we know about, to say that this is not going to be, that he's going to have to suffer, he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be handed over to the officials, they're going to you know, hand him over to the Gentiles, he's going to be crucified. And the one that just blows me away is the one that's found in Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Let's look at that for a moment. Luke 18. 31 to 34, if you have your Bible handy. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside. Now, we don't have time to review the whole history, but they are traveling with a huge group of people on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus is going to be dead in one week. Okay? Jesus is going to be dead in one week. It's the last day. They're traveling up that steep road. And so what, what happened? Jesus took the 12 disciples aside. I'm not quite sure on that narrow road exactly how you would take people aside from the big crowd. But he said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Is that hard to figure out? I mean, is it hard to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, which part of that is hard to understand? But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Why was that? And these times that are recorded in Scripture are things that the disciples had to have remembered to write down years later. Yep. Yep. Think of all the times that Jesus tried to tell them that they didn't remember. Okay, let's just review a little bit of the final events in, in Jesus' life so we can sort of put this picture in, fit this picture in. During the last six months of his life, he collected the largest crowds that he, of any time in his life. And he didn't try to discourage them. He said, yeah, follow me. And so by the time they got to Jericho, there was a huge crowd that was traveling with them up to Jerusalem. And everybody, I tell you, everybody in that crowd was talking about the fact they were going to take Jesus to Jerusalem and they were going to crown him king. Everybody in that crowd was talking about that. So Jesus says, oh, by the way, let me tell you a little different version of how that's going to happen. And you can, again, once again, you can see, huh? What are you talking about? We know we're going to, what? You, you can just see how, you know, it would be really hard for them to, put, to compute it, as we might say in our day. Did they say, Jesus, you're speaking in riddles? They should have. <laughs> That's what they thought. Yeah. Do you think you could point out any other passages in the Old Testament that talk about a Messiah that would suffer? Well, in Psalms 22, mm -hmm. There are a number of messianic prophecies about the uh, the crucifixion. Yeah. So uh, uh, we we and here we come to another problem. In the first hundred or two hundred years after Jesus was here, in the first couple of centuries, there was a huge argument between Jews and Christians, particularly over the Greek scriptures. Because the Christians wanted to say, look at all these places in the Old Testament that matched what happened over here in the New Testament so that we have two halves of a book and they should fit together. And the Jews said, nothing doing. We don't have anything to do with your New Testament. The, the Old Testament is the history of our people. That belongs to us. You can't perver pervert it and make it somehow match with the New Testament. So the Jews would say, no, that was that Psalm 22 is about the suffering of the Jewish people. And Isaiah 53 is about the suffering of the Jewish people. Leave your Messiah out of it. And how would you respond to that? Well, well uh, but they still looked for the Messiah in the, in the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, 
Alfred Edersheim was a Messianic Jew back in the 1800s, and he wrote a book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And in there, he says that the rabbis had a saying that all of the prophets talked about the Messiah all of the time. So in a sense, they were looking for the Messiah in everything, mm -hmm. uh, maybe yeah. even more than we do sometimes. Uh, and, but it doesn't mean they had correct interpretations of it. What would Jesus say to most Adventists in 2018? In light of... Follow me. <laughs> follow me, that's a good comment. Listen to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, could our picture of God and our understanding of the plan of salvation and the great controversy be so much an error that God doesn't want us to tell others? Is that why the end hasn't come? That was an interesting question because I hadn't really... Well, I, on the other hand, when Jesus sent out the, the 70 to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, they didn't have it all together. <laughs> That's true. I don't know what he gave them, whether he gave them a script and said, don't talk beyond this or what, because if you'd have pulled them aside and said, and yeah. had a conversation, there would have been all kinds of stuff that... Yeah. They well, and look at his, 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 his 12 disciples. And I wonder, I think about Judas every time I think about the 12 disciples. The first time he sent them out into Jewish territory in Galilee, said, heal the sick, preach the gospel, raise the dead, mm -hmm. you know, cleanse the lepers. Did they really do that? I think that's what they said uh, when they came back. And he said, rejoice not that uh, about these things, but that your names are written in the kingdom. In the well, as we read on, as we start the book of Acts, in verses, verse 6 and 7 of chapter 1, look at how much they had recovered from their previous thinking. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority and it is not for you to know when they will be. So they were still hoping and desperately hoping that Jesus was going to be the Messiah they wanted. And that's mm -hmm. just 10 days before Pentecost. Yeah. I think you were suggesting or asking by the prior question, mm -hmm. are, is it possible that our views of the second coming are as wrong as those, as those of the Jews at the now first how coming? How could you suggest such a thing? It's, uh, I've thought of that as we've gone through these lessons. Well, we have kind of a rough outline, and yeah. sometimes we speculate beyond the edges of yeah. what's revealed, and that creates problems. Why is it so difficult to give up our cherished ideas and uh, believe what the Bible actually says as opposed to what we want but it we to say? We think we know what it actually says. Well, pride of opinion yeah. and trying to justify whatever it is that we want. Jesus goes on immediately in the next verse and says, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I'm wondering if they're thinking, huh? Did they have any idea at all what that implied? No, they were I, think so. I've had the privilege of visiting the spots where probably four or five of these men ended up dying, bar being buried, actually. And if you travel through Turkey, you'll travel in Italy, you travel in Palestine, you can do some of those kinds of things. And you just wonder, think about how do they get to that? I mean, from this experience here now, what happened in their lives? Because we know very little about <coughs> most of them. We know about Paul was an apostle later. We know about Luke, who wasn't even on this in the, in, in, in the anywhere in the horizon of things yet. We know something about Peter. We know a little bit about some of the other disciples. Almost nothing. What did they do? Where did they go? What did they say? 
Well, Peter tells us, we're going to come across that in one of our upcoming lessons. He says, this Holy Spirit that's coming was predicted way back in the Old Testament. And we would agree, I hope, that, and, and just look at the evidence for that. Look at Luke 4, Luke 4, verses 18 to 21. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus talking to his close neighbors and friends in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. How would it impact you if someone said a prophecy in Scripture is being fulfilled in front of your eyes? And so on whether you were ready to hear, if you had <laughs> ears to hear, yes. eyes to see, if you were distracted and it was getting in the way of your your lunch plans for the day, <laughs> <laughs> you might try to write it off as as just. Something strange. Jesus yeah. seems to suggest that their job was to be personal witnesses. What does a personal witness do? Testify of what they've seen and heard and experienced. So the disciples would be asked to go out as far as the ends of the earth in those days. And what were they supposed to tell? Tell people what you have seen and heard with your own eyes. That, I mean, there's, if you stop and think about it, even on television almost every day, there's somebody who's been through an unusual experience and they call them up as a witness. What did you see? Almost anybody with almost no training can tell you, okay, this is what I saw and da da da, and this is what happened. So it shouldn't have been too difficult for the disciples to tell of the marvelous things they had seen. Um, and I guess I should point out that four things happened as a result of this change in paradigms. God was to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit, number one. They were to be personal witnesses, number two. The plan of the mission started in Jerusalem, we know, and was supposed to spread to Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the world. And then a complete change was to take place in the orientation of their mission. Back in the Old Testament, specifically in Isaiah 2, 1-5, the Jews were supposed to be such a shining example of the truth that people from all over the world would come flocking to them to learn about the truth. Well, it didn't work out quite like that. And so now what is Jesus telling them? Now is the time not for you to sit here in Jerusalem to wait the world, for the world to come to you. The time has come for you to go to the world. This is a complete shift in plans. I think it's interesting to note that Although the Jews had the Word of God mm -hmm. and they had corrupted it, it's also true that there was still more logic in their message than in the messages of the pagans of, their t of that time. Mm -hmm. As a result of it, many of the pagans had converted to Judaism by the time Jesus came, which is really a good thing because there were that many more people who were likely to recognize the message from Jesus. Yeah. Well, and can you think of some obvious examples just in the stories that we have recorded in the New Testament? People who were pagans, people who were not Jews, but had been already pretty much convinced by what they knew about Jews, that Ju Judaism was better than what their religion is. The two Greeks that came uh, okay. at the time of the... Uh, okay, there's a couple. The we don't know for sure what they're... But there's two... The Ethiopian eunuch. Mm. There's one, but he was already a Jew before he came. He had become a, Jew a believer. Version, yeah. Okay, but there's two I, I, you should, I think of. The obvious one in my mind is Cornelius, uh -huh. coming up pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a guy who's absolutely convinced he's praying for the Jewish people. And, the, and even earlier in the days of Jesus, 
the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion, and, and, and yeah, exactly, who came to get have his servant healed. He had already built a synagogue for the Jews because he clearly believed that Judaism, or well, whatever you choose to call it, the, the true message about God was superior to what he believed. The Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman, she well. got it at, the, at that point. She wasn't, um, yeah. Well, have any of you actually had a fruit basket upset in your thinking? Oh, yes. <laughs> How easy is that? Especially when it comes to religion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had one when I came here to medicine. And it was a, it was a marvelous experience. It was a little bit shaky at first. Well, look at Acts 1, 9 to 11. What comes next? After saying this, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He's taken them across the, the Mount of Olives, and he's probably just beyond that a little ways, somewhere close to Bethany. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away, when two men, not really men, dressed in white, suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven, taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. Is that an important uh, message in our understanding of the gospel? Very important in my opinion. I mean, he's going to come back the same way he went. Okay? Is that important? Well, Ellen White talks about Satan impersonating the coming, mm -hmm. but not in the same detail. Well, what do, how do we deal and with he, the people? Jesus also warned, you know, if they say he's out, you know, I'm out in the desert or I'm here, don't believe them. Yeah. And, I mean, look at all the people who talk about, I mean, it's not so popular as it used to be, the bumper stickers, you know, if there's nobody driving, I've been raptured. I mean, how do we respond? This verse. Yeah. In this, here it doesn't say that there's a great throng of angels around or glory or lights or anything of that sort. It does That's sound right. very, you know, almost like a rapture, not quite, but, uh, you know, well. Jesus just goes up into the clouds. It doesn't say it in this verse, but there's other verses that we will look at later that talks about he comes with all the angels. That's when he comes, yeah. uh, his going, oh. and then we oh, read he'll but, come back in the same way. Well, yeah. What does that mean? Now, we have the interpretation that yeah. he was coming with great glory in the clouds and so on, mm -hmm. and I think that's true, but what is the meaning of this sentence right after he just goes up into the clouds. Well, what it meant to the disciples right there is he might come next week. I think that's what they really thought. Well, that he would, and he would come to the earth. He yeah. started here, he went up, yep. so he's going to come. Coming back. Coming back, uh, as opposed to us. Well, see, even in that, he, we, we go up. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in which we go up to meet him in the air. It's interesting that two angels stayed and, and gave the, the disciples this message. Do we know anything about those two angels? Well, well there were two angels. What? Well, I was just going to say there were several references to yeah. two angels in other parts. L let's look at that for a moment. Two angels sat in the tomb when Mary approached. That's discussed in Desire of Ages 789, paragraph 4. Who were those two angels? Those two angels had apparently served as Jesus' guardian angels throughout his lifetime. And I quote here, Carrie, you, I think you've got that passage. Yes. While the disciples were still gazing upward, voices addressed them which sounded like richest music. They turned and saw two angels in the form of men who spoke to them, saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. 
These angels were of the company that had been waiting in a shining cloud to escort Jesus to his heavenly home. The most exalted of the angel throng, they were the two who had come to the tomb of Christ's resurrection, and they had been with him throughout his life on earth. With eager desire, all heaven had waited for the end of his tarrying in a world marred by the curse of sin. The time had now come for the heavenly universe to receive their king. Did not the two angels long to join the throng that welcomed Jesus? But in sympathy and love for those whom he had left, they waited to give them comfort. Now I'm going to read Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And this has all come from the Tsar of Ages, 831-1-832, paragraph 1. Amazing. Did Jesus, was Jesus under so much peril and so many attacks from the devil and all his angels that he required two guardian angels just to, just to protect him? And who was at least one of those angels we know by name? Gabriel. Gabriel. Apparently Gabriel was one of his guardian angels, if we put all those pieces together. Well, there are a number of passages in the New Testament suggesting that God raised Jesus from the dead. Places like Acts 2, 24 and 32, Romans 6, 4, Romans 10, 9, but contrast the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 19, and John 10, verses 17 to 18. So what actually happened at the resurrection? Those two angels came down and? Well, this again from Desire of Ages 785. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in him himself. Yes. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life and I might, that I might gain it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken of to the priests and rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, John 10, 17, 18, and 2, 19. Over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. This was spoken also at the resurrection of Lazarus in John eleven twenty five. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are descendant, recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph to the humblest animate being, all are replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. Amen. It would be impossible for deity to die. The humanity of Jesus died, and of course we have a really hard time sort of putting that all together, but Christ, his divine side, which had remained quiescent during his lifetime on this earth, arose at the voice of the angel, proclaimed over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, I am the resurrection and the life. Only God could make such a statement. Satan would love to be able to do, but he can't. But he only rose when his father called him, yes. as he said throughout his earthly life. Exactly. I only do what the father says. So, in a sense, uh, the father did oh, yeah. bring Absolutely. him back to life because it was it was it's, his his command at at his command that Jesus. Um, an illustration I've heard, heard used before about this is, okay, I buy a piece of property out here and I'm going to build a house on it. So I have someone drop an architect drop plans for me and I say I'm building a house. Well, not really. The architect says, well, I'm I'm putting together a house for you, and then the car the 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 
contractor comes and then those people working on them and, and everyone says, I'm building this house. Well, who is building the house? So everybody has a part everybody in it. Everybody is. But yeah. Everybody has a part in it. Yeah. So I'm not discounting the Father's right. comments. Exactly. Well, the visible ascension of Jesus into the heavens and the promise of the angels to make it clear that he will come again in a very visible manner. Of course, he will not be alone. He will be accompanied by the Father, by the Holy Spirit, and by the entire host of angels who will fill the entire sky with their bright, shining presences. No you imitation, a, Jesus. You have a quotation that says the Father and the Holy Spirit will be there? In the not, not in the scriptures. I'm going to give you some scripture things. Look, look at Luke 9, 26. Uh -huh. If people are ashamed of me and my teaching, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father. So it's sort of implied there and of the holy angels. That's one. Second Thessalonians 1, 7. And he will give relief to you who suffer and to us as well. He will do this when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven with his mighty angels. And I think I need to make this text a little bit larger. No, it's okay. It's, I guess it's up to big size. So I have those, but uh, we have the passage in Revelation which suggests that heaven's going to be quiet. It's going to be quiet because everybody's gone. Mm. That's one possible interpretation. Possible I, interpretation. I think there yeah. may be others. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, think about it. If you were an angel or if, if you were the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you want to be here for the most, probably well, the, the most? the Holy Spirit is here everywhere. by default. Sure, uh, sure. In, in the believers yeah. who are mm -hmm. taken up. I'm yeah. Just not sure whether the Father will be there in His presence because it, it's Christ. The, it's the kingdom of glory now. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ has assumed His. He's now um, been given the kingdom that His Father promised Him, and so I'm not sure if the Father really needs to be there in a physical, uh, manifested well. way. But I, I know they were all there at His baptism. So, but I. I can't imagine why they wouldn't want to be there. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's important to notice that neither Jesus nor the two angels that spoke to the disciples gave any precise dates or times or ways to know exactly when it's going to happen. So what happened next? They returned to the upper room of Jerusalem and fairly quickly they set about to do what that needed to be done next. Well, they had to find somebody to replace Judas. Yeah. We can't have just why 11. Need, we, yeah, why did they need to have 12? Well, 12 is a perfect number. 12 is a complete number. Yeah. Well, there were 12 uh, sons of Jacob. Sons, son, you know, in the Old Testament. And then when we see in Revelation that there are now 12 gates and 12 foundations that there, there seems to be some something moving in that direction that we need yeah. to have 12. Christ didn't uh, have any alternates out there like we do for our juries. Yeah. Well, he did have alternates. And that, that's what he's going to talk about now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's look at the verses. Acts 1, 12 to 14. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Oz, which is about a kilometer away from the city, or two-thirds of a mile. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Patriot, and Judas son of James. They gathered frequently to pray as a group together with the women and with Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. A few days later there was a meeting and we'll get on to that in a moment. So it wasn't just the 11, it was a larger group. Later it's going to talk about 120. So the upper room in Jerusalem was in the home of John Mark's parents. Uh, I don't know if we need to go to the details of how we figured that out. It's uh, Acts 12, 11 to 15, and Mark, four, well, and just an interesting little sidelight. Look at Mark 14, verse 51. And this is talking about Jesus and his disciples when they left the upper room, headed for the Garden of Gethsemane. And it it goes on and on like just all the other Gospels talk about. But in the Mark, it says, then all the, and, and when, the, when, the, when the army or the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, then all the disciples left him and ran away. A certain young man, dressed only in a linen cloth, was following Jesus. 
They tried to arrest him, but he ran away naked, leaving the cloth behind. Who do you suppose that was? The one writing the story. <laughs> the one writing the story, almost certainly. John Mark says, I was there too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what do they do? The brothers of Jesus were almost certainly the older children of, of, of Joseph by a prior marriage. Jesus had older sisters as well, Matthew 13, 55 to 56, Mark 6 through 6, verse 3. If the law of averages holds true, he had four older brothers, he might have had four older sisters, he would be the ninth child in that family. Have you ever thought about that? Different mother and different father, though. Yes. But several places we know they tried to tell Jesus what to do because they were older and obviously wiser than he was. <laughs> well, it's pretty clear that the disciples went back and forth from staying in the upper room and meeting together as a group and talking about their Christian ideas to the temple where they praised God, worshipped and sang together. Um, so, Going on now, <coughs> verses 15 to 22, a few days later there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 in all, and Peter stood up to speak. My fellow believers, he said, the scripture had to come to in which the Holy Spirit, speaking through David, made a prediction about Judas, who was the guide for those who arrested Jesus. Judas was a member of our group, for he had been chosen to have a part in our work. With the money that Judas got for his evil act, we're going to drop that anyway, but he's written the book of Psalms, many, and so forth and so forth anyway. Uh, so then someone must join us as a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So they thought they needed to choose somebody to be specifically a witness to the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. Because 12 was a perfect number. 12 was a perfect number. So who did they choose? Well, they had a couple candidates and they said, eh, either one will do. Yeah. But how, how, how did they choose the two candidates? Do you remember? Well, okay. it says that mm -hmm. they prayed. Okay. And they cast lots, whatever that was. Okay, they choose, that's choosing between the two candidates. How did they choose the two first? It had to be someone that had been with Jesus the entire the time that, that they were with yeah. him and someone that had been at the res someone that had witnessed uh, the time of the resurrection. Yeah. So there were a lot of other people, apparently, who had been closely associated with Jesus for quite a long period of time. So they felt these are the people who have been with Jesus almost as much as we have. They're the ones, among them, should be the ones we would choose. So which those makes are the sense. alternate jurors? Those are the alternate jurors. Yeah. Which is, it's interesting to note that uh, Judas was not chosen by Jesus himself. No, he was not. And nor was this one. Yes. But Paul later on is chosen by Jesus. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, guess what? They'd use the magic method, they cast lots. How did they do that? We have no idea. Well, they prayed first, at least. Yes, yeah. And clearly in Scripture, on several occasions, we know that God guided that casting of lots. I mean, we think about Achan, we think about some other places in Scripture. Well, Leviticus 16, they yeah. cast lot to choose which one of the two goats. Yeah. Well, did, did, why don't we use casting of lots today? Is it just because we don't know how they did it? We could probably figure out some method that would be more or less equal and probability? Well, we don't know exactly how. And we don't have a Urim and Thummim either. Unfortunately. They didn't, but I mean, it, that would have been another method of yeah. determining God's will. But uh, uh, why don't we turn? Why don't we choose uh, church leaders like that today? Why doesn't God says that one right there? Well, he chose David, and look what happened. <laughs> exactly. And that, you see, if, if we left it to God, and we said, okay, and that person makes some mistakes, like Solomon, even much worse, and David, what happened to him, who would we blame? God. God, of course. God's will. 
And how many yeah. religions have that? Well, whatever happens is God's will. Yeah. Okay, so getting down, we need to finish up because we're running out of time. Don't we live in times which are just as significant as the times which they lived in? Perhaps more so. Yes. Perhaps more so. Yeah. So how do we fit into this whole story? Someone got that for us, a Savior's Commission? The Savior's Commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers in Christ to the end of time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. Uh, all who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow man. For this work the church was established, and all who take it upon themselves, it's, uh, take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. Uh, Desire of Ages 8.22, second paragraph. Are we all doing that? Well, the disciples were very, find, very anxious to find out when Jesus would return. We now know, from our perspective at this end of history, that there were several long time periods that were prophesied that they didn't know about, apparently. And they took take us all the way down to 1844. But the disciples were blissfully ignorant of all that. Well, what does Ellen White say about setting time in our day? Gordon? Review and Herald, March 22, 1892, and also Selected Messages, Volume 1, says, there will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to follow the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Okay, and she added, Myra? Anyone who shall stand up to proclaim the message, to announce the hour, the day, the year of Christ's appearing, has taken up a yoke and is proclaiming a message that the Lord has never given him. So, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, September 12, 1893. Yeah. Well, doesn't God still need witnesses to the great controversy, especially to the life of Christ? I mean, isn't it needed, those kind of witnesses needed as much now as they were then? Of course they are, and we ought to be ministers in a way. Uh, God wants a kingdom of priests. That mm -hmm. would be including all of us. Exactly. First Peter. Yeah. First Peter and Exodus 19. Yeah, exactly. For that was from, we have it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's yeah. right. Well, if we knew the day and the hour, we wouldn't We would procrastinate as long we, as possible. That's right. right. He wants us to be task-oriented, not time-oriented. So do we feel like we really are a part of the redemptive mission of Christ? Do we feel like we have any responsibility for getting the message out? Gospel of the kingdom. This yeah, gospel preaching. of the kingdom, yeah. Well, in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, there's an interesting comment. Jim, would you read that for us? The historic expansion of the church was not solely the result of the work of humans, but of the work of the Holy Spirit. One could even say that we are studying not so much the Acts of the Apostles this quarter as we are studying the Acts of the Holy Spirit. How does the book of the, excuse me, how does the book of Acts confirm this assessment? Well, it's interesting to note the book of Acts ends suddenly as if Luke had intended to write more. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Was he ready? Was he pre was he expecting to write maybe volume three? He's written two volumes already. Maybe he did, and we don't even know it. <laughs> That's also possible. He got lost somewhere in the. He ran out of ink. <laughs> ran no, out of ink. There's uh, information about the Old Testament in the New Testament that we have nowhere in the Old Testament. Yeah, this is true. Prophecies about Jesus, for example. We don't know when he died. It's no? possible that he finished, he got to that point and perhaps he uh, passed away for, for whatever reason at that point. 
Maybe. Uh, and there were persecutions, and books were burnt. And mm -hmm. Well, and you remember that, um, or probably as I should, maybe I shouldn't so, can't say it quite so positively, young people's groups, groups often talk about Acts 28 mm -hmm. and Acts 29. And why would they talk about that? Their idea would be, we are supposed to be writing the rest of that story, right? And how much closer are we to the second coming than they were? As we begin to study the book of Acts, notice this five-point summary given by Luke of what, must, of what we must do to be a part of it. One, be convicted about the mission of Jesus, Acts 1, 1 to 3. Two, be alert and wait for the reception of the Holy Spirit, Acts 1, 4 and 5. Three, be more concerned about the what rather than the when of the kingdom, Acts 1, 4 to 7. Be ready to receive the Spirit, Acts 1, verse 8. And five, be witnesses in every place from our homes to the world. What would happen if we all did that? Which, which we are told in the, in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, but there's three things that Christians need to do to, to get ready. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Which of those three do you think we are most efficient at? Not most efficient, most deficient. Probably all of them. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not, but com comparatively. Could it be witnessing? How many of us are active members of the church, the members that you know in the church around you, how many of them are actively witnessing? Now, there may not be a whole lot that are studying the Bible faithfully or praying as they should, and, but that's more of a private matter. But how many are actively witnessing? If every member of our church of 7,000 people were actively witnessing, how many baptisms would there be every week? You thought about that? Well, as Christians, we are almost totally dependent on the book of Acts for our understanding of what happened in the early history of the church. Do you know of any other histories of the early church, reliable histories of the early church? While Peter and Paul were the main characters in this book, a number of others, including Stephen, think about him, Philip, Cornelius, Barnabas, John Mark, Priscilla and Aquila, Dorcas, Luke, and others had cameo appearances. But the book of Acts makes it clear that everyone who claims the name of Jesus is to be a part of that ultimate group. So what are we doing to finish the gospel? What percentage of our time is spent in doing that? Well, think about Dr. Luke. He probably got all this information, put it together, during the time when Paul was in prison in Caesarea Maritime, and Luke had come with him to, to Palestine, and Luke was probably around, what do you know, what do you know, what do you know, what do you know about Jesus? What, tell me what you know. He was not a Jew, he was a Greek physician. He wrote the longest account of the story of Jesus himself. And then in volume two of his writings, Luke gave us the book of Acts. We are so indebted to him for so many things. Would it be fair to call his books the origin and history of the Christian church? That might not be too bad a title, huh? Did the disciples recognize that Satan had been defeated at the cross? Did they have any notion of the great controversy as we understand it? Did they understand that they had been given the most important message ever to be given to our world? Did they recognize that they had become a part of the kingdom of God? It's interesting to notice that in the New King James Version, the word kingdom and its various iterations is used again and again in the Gospels, 50 times in Matthew, 13 times in Mark, 37 times in Luke, and five in the Gospel of John. That new kingdom had a completely new orientation. And I think you know something about that, Gary? Yes. <clears throat> the Gospel Commission is the great missionary charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them, they were to go to the people with their message. 
The disciples were to carry their work forward in Christ's name. Every word and act was to fasten attention on his name as possessing that vital power by which sinners may be saved. Their faith was to center in him who is the source of mercy and power. In his name they were to present their petitions to the Father and they would receive answer. They were to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ's name was to be their watchword, their badge of distinction, their bond of union, the authority for their course of action, and the source of their success. Nothing was to be recognized in his kingdom that did not bear his name and superscription. It came from the Acts of the Apostle, page 28, paragraph 2. Okay, Carrie, I'm sorry, I jumped over one that I was supposed to read. Of the poor in spirit, Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom is not, as Christ hearers had hoped, a temporal and earthly dominion. Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom of his love, his grace, his righteousness. The ensign of the Messiah's reign is distinguished by the likeness of the Son of Man. His subjects are the poor in spirit, the meek, the persecuted for Christlessness' sake. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Though not yet fully accomplished, the work is begun in them, which will make them meet for the, to be partakers of the inheritances of the saints in light. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, paragraph, page 8, paragraph 1. And then we have one more comment, I think, Fred? Yes, um, also taken from Desire of Ages, page 249 and 250, where Ellen White says, uh, Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions of erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patient, uh, patently uh, threading the ground of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. Brent, I'm going to have to interrupt you here because our time is running out. Uh, we'll encourage all of you to look at the rest of that, Desire of Ages 249 and 250. But basically that message is you could be chosen too. In fact, you have been chosen. God is calling you to help finish the work which God gave those disciples 2,000 years ago. Are you ready? Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to study these words of excitement, these words of challenge, these words of understanding of your message. May we, fortunately, be awake to what we need to do so that we can be a part of those who will carry this final message to a world in need is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.